So uh, without any, any further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Beth Coleman. She is a uh, social scientist and lecturer at the, the, the Resources, Environment, and Development Group at the AMU Crawford School of Public Policy. Research interest is in how groups of people interact with each other, especially in settings of social and political conflict with regard to climate and environmental issues. Recent research projects have included study of conflict about wind energy development, psychological underpinnings of constructive governance received from native emissions, and the role of trust between climate researchers and policy makers. Today, uh, Beck will be talking to us about how we can work on the contours of the human mind and human behavior to get better climate outcomes for people in the environment. Okay. Hello, everybody. So I'm going to go through a pretty rapid fire walkthrough of some of the really interesting research developments on how we communicate and think about climate change that have come out mainly in the last 12 months or so. So thank you to Mark for introducing the um, public opinion data that we've got from the Lowy Institute. It's useful to look at where we're at before we think about how we communicate about these sorts of issues. But we can also look at this data by age. So young people, 18 to 29 year olds, are following the same pattern of opinion change on climate change as the population as a whole, but just much more profoundly. We can also look at 60 plus age group. Hmm, I won't comment to you further. We also got some interesting public opinion data from the Australia Institute, which I think Anna Greta started mentioning earlier. And the thing that's noteworthy here is that we've got data from July 2019 and then January 2020. We can see there's been a pretty big change in the number of people who are very concerned about climate change. Can you think of something that's happened in Australia in <laughs> the last six months that could lead to that? And so they also asked about how many people think climate change made this summer bushfires worse. And so it's two thirds of people. And perhaps that's the other side of what Anna Greta was saying about there being around 30% of people that don't see that risk. But do extreme weather events affect public opinion? We've got mixed evidence of this. So this meta-analysis of the literature came out last year, and it told us that temperature anomalies, experiencing those, tends to have a small effect on public opinion. Extreme weather events are much more variable because extreme weather events can be totally variable too. But the things that are really important in shaping what outcome we see in terms of public opinion are things like the social and political context and what prior climate change views are. And so some research that's come out of California that looked at the impact of the California wildfires and climate change opinion saw that exposure to the wildfires did affect opinion. It decayed with distance from the fire. But that was only the case for Democrat voters. And so that brings me to the next point. So here in Australia, we are second only to the United States in terms of how invited we are on climate change along left-right political lines. Politics is really important when we think about the social dimension of climate change, think about communicating climate change. So this research came out of the ANU from Matt Nurse and Will Grant last year, and they replicated a US study that showed how you give people numbers about an issue, and if it's a non-contentious issue, people tend to make sense of the numbers correctly or incorrectly, whatever, it's they're good at math or they're not. But if you make it on a contentious issue, you can see that those patterns shift. And so this is a non-contentious issue. This was about whether um, skin cream was effective. And what you can see in the two different bars are One Nation voters and Greens voters. So they got the answer correct and incorrect about the same amount of time. But if you change the data and you make it about climate change, as these two um, bars are on the other side, you can see that the rate of correct interpretation and incorrect interpretation shift. And that's because we can see that when you've got these political allegiances wrapped up in an issue of climate change, it affects how we make sense of data that's given to us. So in the US, the same um, results were found with Democrats and Republicans. They're more polarized than us. We've got to go to 
The Greens and One Nation to get that polarisation, but it's still there. We've got the same quantum as here in Australia. So if we talk about the influence of politics, this is an experiment that looked at the influence of what we understand our political leaders to think on climate change. And so these numbers over on this side, whoops, um, nearer to me here, 97, 90, 74, 49%. These are the levels of support for the concept of an emissions trading scheme by a political party. On the other side is the same question, but with this additional comment inserted saying that the leaders of the two major parties, the time that the research was conducted, that's a change that we see in public opinion. So coalition voters go from 49% support to 58% support for an emissions trading scheme if they're primed with information that the political party leaders support it. Labor voters go down 10 percentage points, though. <laughs> so what that tells us is that these things are really important to how we understand issues like climate change. This is another experimental study that came out of the US last year. And what this showed us was that if your opinion deviant from the group to which you belong, you perceive what everyone else thinks really differently from if your opinion is aligned with the group to which you belong. So again, this is in the political context where if you're an opinion deviant Republican, it means that you think climate change is a thing. If you're an opinion deviant Democrat, it means you think climate change isn't happening. And so what you can see is that from those opinion deviant perspectives, they don't see all that much difference among Democrats and Republicans in terms of attitudes toward climate change. But if you agree with the leader of your party, you see that there's much more polarization between your group and the other group. When we're talking about politics, we can also think about political institutions. And so this research that you're looking at on the screen is a study of 23 European countries and how much those countries have support the idea of taxes to be implemented in order to deal with climate change. And what we can see on the left is a correlation between how much people in the countries believe in climate change and their support for taxes. And there's basically no relationship there which is interesting. And in the other panel, we can see that it's actually where we start to see that relationship is where you measure political trust. So this is trust in our political institutions like democracy. And so maybe this tells us that there's something going on with these broader systems of politics that we need to think about as we deal with climate change. So we can also think about who's a credible source of information. I'm sure you all agree with me that that's an example of a pretty credible source of information. And so we've got research as well that shows that we're more likely to trust sources of information and perceive them as being credible if we think that they have shared values and goals as we do. We want to think that they're like us. So if they tell us information that's good for them, we can think it's probably good for us as well. But particularly when it comes to scientific experts, we also want to see that they've got objectivity and political neutrality. And that's really challenging a line to walk in this sort of space where the science and the politics and the policy of society is so deeply entangled. When it comes to how much we trust ex experts, we can also think about how much an expert's behavior matches their message. So this research found that we want to see that experts that are telling us about climate change are making changes in their own personal life, but not so many changes that they're really weird and different from us. <laughs> so we want to see if they're telling us about climate change that they make moderate lifestyle changes, but they don't go so transformative as to think that they're not like us at all. And on behaviour change, we've got mounting, mounting, mounting evidence for the value of social norms. So this is where we see that people around us are doing something so it seems like the normal thing to do in a social setting so we pick it up ourselves. But the research is also pointing to us that social norms are most effective when they are shown, not when they're told. So lectures about what one should do are less effective than seeing someone else performing an action. And we're also getting more evidence that behavioural spillover is limited. So spillover is the idea that you do one behaviour and it feels good, so you do another behaviour and it feels good and you keep going. So this again highlights that we can't think about these sorts of behaviour changes in terms of individual people. We have to think about it in terms of the bigger community or social change. When we talk about climate change, we're also getting more evidence that fatalism doesn't help. So talking about climate change as being unstoppable can actually paralyze us. 
but a little bit of worry is really useful. I think if you're all here for the first session, you probably feel a little bit of worry. I know I do. But what we need to know is that we've got a sense of agency and that there's some efficacy with the steps that we can take to deal with it. Now, this is an interesting way of thinking about not just how we communicate about climate change, but who we communicate to and what they want in terms of communication. And so this looks at what I find an awkward term, cognitive complexity. And this is the idea that you can hold multiple different concepts in your mind at the same time when understanding an issue. So I'm sure all of you folks with very high cognitive complexity would be unsurprised that people who accept that climate change is real and caused by humans tend to be able to deal with more complex issues. So this is experimental data as well. But the thing that's really interesting and worth noting here is that we can think about giving one-sided arguments for climate change, so like saying, here's a fact, or we can give two-sided arguments about climate change, and this is where we start to say, here's a misconception and here's the corrected fact. And how you approach it has different levels of um, effectiveness for these two different groups. So people who are able to hold multiple concepts in their mind at the same time actually benefit in terms of building their understanding about climate change by being told something that's incorrect and the fact that corrects it. Whereas people that are much more single-minded and just want one simple answer, it's a lot better if they hear just a single message and then you get that same complexity. And so we can also think about how we as consumers of information, how we go out and seek things to be communicated to us. This study looked at the idea of snap news, which is probably my favorite concept from research in the last 12 months. <laughs> And it's this idea that we consume news and we snap on it. So we sit there and we scroll through our feed and we see headlines and pictures, maybe a few lines here and there, but we don't engage deeply. We don't chew our food enough times before we slow it down and move on to the next thing. And this was looking at the difference between snap news versus engaging really deeply in a single news article. I'm sure you'll all be really shocked to hear that if you consume a lot of snap news, how much you think you know goes up, but how much you actually know doesn't go up. <laughs> it's the opposite if you read a proper news article in depth. But the thing that's really important about this is if we want to look at how strong are people's opinions about these issues and how much do they really want to talk about it, that comes from how much you think you know, not from how much you actually know. So think about what that might mean next time you hear someone talking really loudly about a topic that they might not know much about. <laughs> but the good news is, is that conversations can be really valuable. This is data from an educational intervention that was run in the United States where schools taught information about climate change. They measured the impact on children's views on climate change, the participants. They also measured the impact on the parents of the children. So think about what this means when we can see the difference in attitudes by age. We know that politics is a really important um, dividing factor in attitudes about climate change. And what we can see is a control condition where there was no climate change educational intervention in school versus where there was. Is the difference between parents' views on climate change before and after changed substantially? And the change was most dramatic for the people who are least receptive to climate change messages. So in this context, in the US context, it's conservative people, also dads, and also daughters were better um, communicators than their sons, than his mothers for some reason. We've also got evidence that conversations, not just kids and parents, but conversations with friends and family are really valuable. And so this idea that we talk about climate change with the people around us, Noting that it has become somewhat of a taboo is a really empowering thing to do. So we get this pro-climate feedback loop where the more you talk about climate change, the more you come to learn about it. So the more you want to talk about it. And it goes and it goes and it goes. And it's useful for sharing information, but it's also useful for dealing with our anxieties. For starting to realize that actually most people probably don't have these horrendously rabid opinions that we think we don't want to disturb that we can talk about these issues. And so one of the things that we can all do is go away and have conversations about climate change, but that's not always easy. And so I encourage you to go and look at this new resource that came out last year from a group called Climate Outreach. They're a um, sort of quasi-research organization based in the UK. 
and they produce lots of really practical material around communicating on climate change. This particular one is how to have conversations about climate change. And so they've broken it down into real talk, whatever. Um, but you can kind of summarize it as just don't be an ass. <laughs> like, be respectful, ask more questions than things that you tell people. Make sure it's an enjoyable conversation. Make it happen over and over again. It's not just one single conflagration of horrible emotions and you never talk about it. This is really useful if you find the idea of having conversations about climate change intimidating, because I know it can be. I have no idea how long I just talked for. I brought my phone to time and I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>